Hello everyone, a very good morning and welcome to An Academy, a one-stop destination for the English medium civil services aspirants. Welcome to the daily Hindu news analysis. So let's begin our discussion by first looking at the topics that we are going to discuss. From the Delhi edition of the Hindu, I have chosen six important articles for a detailed analysis. We have three articles that are relevant for the mains exam and three smaller articles that are important for the prelims examination. So let's take a look at all these topics one by one. And if you guys are liking these initiatives, do support us with your likes, your comments, and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Before we start, we have a small announcement. On 31st March, we shall be conducting an All India Prelims Mock Test. This will give you an opportunity to test yourself before the upcoming prelims. And we will be conducting the tests both for your GS paper and as well as for the CSAT paper. For further details, you can click on the link provided in the video description below. With this, let's begin with the analysis of today's The Hindu by taking up this column from page number 10. This article deals with the question of seeking votes in the name of religion. The article is exploring a very, very important topic. Now that it is election season and the elections have been notified, political parties have already started their electoral campaigns and there have been few recent instances where political leaders have been exploiting religious sentiments in order to seek votes. Now this clearly is illegal and it is categorized as a electoral corrupt practice. But still we have many such cases and incidents which keep happening repeatedly. And the current cases which are in news, it involves top leaders like Rahul Gandhi and Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Recently Rahul Gandhi has been accused of hurting religious sentiments and Prime Minister Modi also has been accused on the same issue of seeking votes on religious grounds. Now both these acts actually qualify to be termed as corrupt electoral practices. So that is why this column is examining the issue of seeking votes in the name of religion or even in the name of caste or language etc. Essentially if political parties or political leaders and the candidates if they are trying to divide the electorate, if they are trying to increase the divisions and the polarization in the society just to win elections, then this is clearly classified as illegal corrupt electoral practice. So let's explore this important issue in detail given that general elections are all scheduled, all set to be held in a few weeks. First, let's understand why this practice is illegal. What is the law related to this provision? We have the representation of the People Act or RPA that deals with representation of people, conduct of elections, regulation of political parties, etc. So under the law, we have section 123 that prohibits corrupt electoral practices. It is section 123 of RPA that recognizes such corrupt electoral practices. If you look at clause 3 of section 123, it clearly prohibits seeking votes on the grounds of religion, caste or community or race or language. Exploiting social divisions in the country for seeking votes from the electorate just to win the elections is prohibited under this provision. It's clearly recognized as a corrupt electoral practice. If you look at 3A, clause 3A under section 123, it denounces any practice where political parties or candidates are promoting enmity and hatred in the society and increasing divisions just to seek votes and win elections. So such practices are clearly prohibited and declared as illegal and corrupt. So on one hand, you can't seek votes in the name of religion, race, caste, community and language. And at the same time, you can't promote enmity or hatred or divisions between different communities just so that you can get votes and win elections. Both are prohibited and recognized as corrupt electoral practices. In fact, 
for the violation of these provisions, there is a very strict punishment as well. If candidates are held guilty of these corrupt practices, they can be debarred from elections for a maximum period of six years. This is the maximum punishment that can be delivered. Such candidates or other party members who are acting on behalf of a candidate, if they are promoting religious enmity or caste divisions or linguistic divisions, if they are seeking votes in the name of these uh, social identities, right? then they can be debarred from contesting elections for a maximum of six years. So very stringent punishment is provided for such a corrupt electoral practice under the law. Even the Supreme Court of India has passed some very important observations regarding this issue. Back in 2017, there was a very important case related to the same issue which was examined by the Supreme Court in detail. It was a constitution bench of the Supreme Court, a seven judge constitution bench that ex examined this issue in the Abhiram Singh case. Please make a note of this case as well. You can quote this if there is a question on this topic. Because the observations of the constitution bench in this particular case is extremely important. The majority verdict which was delivered in a 4 is to 3 ratio, meaning 4 of the judges, right? they agreed that such practices are corrupt electoral practices. The majority, majority judgment clearly pointed out that if any candidate from any party or if an agent who is acting on their behalf, it could be other political leaders who are campaigning for another candidate or it could be so-called religious leaders or gurus or whoever it is who is campaigning on behalf of a candidate or even celebrity campaigners who are hired by parties and candidates. Whoever it is who is acting on behalf of a candidate, if they are seeking votes on the lines of religion, caste, language, etc. or if they are promoting hatred and divisions, in that case, this act will be disqualified. It will be treated as a corrupt electoral practice and such candidates can be debarred from contesting elections. The Supreme Court upheld the validity of this law in the 2017 case and clearly pointed out that such practices are impermissible in a secular democracy. The Supreme Court also observed that elections, be it to the parliament or the state legislature, are inherently supposed to be secular and it should be devoid of all these divisions, these societal divisions. Especially in a multi-diverse country like India, you can't have political parties and politicians dividing the society on religious lines, caste and linguistic lines just so that they can get votes and win elections. So the law prohibits this and even the Supreme Court has upheld this view and it has qualified or it has recognized all these acts as corrupt electoral practices. Now let us see how Election Commission of India tries to tackle these problems. We have the Model Code of Conduct or the MCC which kicks into effect immediately after elections are notified. As soon as the election schedule is announced by the Election Commission, from then till the results are announced. For that entire period, the Model Code of Conduct comes into effect. Now, Model Code of Conduct is essentially a set of guidelines and norms that the Election Commission has devised by working with the political parties themselves. So, there is no legal backing to it. It has no statutory backing. So, it can't be very strictly enforced. But however, Election Commission has been trying to implement the code as strictly as possible since the 1990s. Over the last three decades, the model code of conduct has acquired more significance. Especially under legendary Chief Election Commissioner T.N. Session, the MCC was very strictly enforced by using some other re related provisions of the law which could provide legal backing for the implementation of the code. But model code by itself does not have any legal or statutory backing. So essentially, politicians, political leaders, the candidates and the parties are expected to abide by the standards, the guidelines and the norms established under the model code. So it basically places some restrictions on electoral campaigns, on expenditure, on how they can use media platforms for campaigning purposes. It also places certain restrictions regarding a campaign near polling stations on the electoral day, right? It places few uh, norms with regard to the place where the votes are counted on, vo on uh, results day. So such 
norms and restrictions are placed. But however, the problem is the election commission has not been consistent with its enforcement. There has been criticism every now and then that election commission often ignores some of the major violations which are done by some senior leaders and party members. Whereas on same issues, other political leaders and parties have been uh, criticized and punished by the election commission. The election commission ta can take some action as well in case of violation of model code. Right? The model code says that there should be complete respect towards the norms, the, the code of conduct. It should be observed in letter and spirit. That's what the election commission expects. But every now and then, our political leaders and leaders from different parties, they blatantly violate these norms. And in many cases, no action is taken by the election commission. Even after receiving complaints, sometimes the election commission doesn't act. And in some cases, it acts against few candidates and few parties, giving rise to allegations that election commission is biased. It's, it's not functioning in a fair manner. So these have been accusations that have persisted over the years. But however, the model code does provide an enforcement option for the election commission. Right? Especially when it comes to seeking votes in the name of religion or if candidates are promoting hatred or enmity. Right? Election commission can debar them from campaigns. It can even debar them from contesting the election itself. Right? By invoking section 123 of the Representation of the People Act. Model code also says that places of worship, be it a mosque or a temple or a church or any pla place of worship, should not be used for electoral purposes. This is something which is most commonly violated in India since many decades. Parties have been fighting elections in the name of caste. Parties have been seeking votes in the name of religion from a very long time. And yet election commission has not been effective in all these instances. For example, there are many states in India where elections are entirely based on the caste equations. Especially if you look at Bihar, Karnataka, right? The elections are entirely determined by the caste equations and parties actually, they, they leverage the caste equations and try to win votes. Same with religion. Major national parties have been always polarizing the society on religious lines, dividing religious communities and seeking votes from their respective vote banks. This has been the tradition and the secular fabric of the nation has indeed been weakened by some of the political parties and leaders. But yet, election commission has not been able to act against them strictly. So that is a concern which the writers of the column also point out. In fact, if you look at these violations, there's only one major politician who has ever been convicted of this offense. It is Bal Takre of Shiv Sena, who was convicted in 1995 for seeking votes in the name of language and religion. As you know, Shiv Sena happens to be a right-wing conservative party which has often fought elections on the lines of uh, language, re uh, re regional identity and religion. So, it is only Bal Takre, who, is one of the pro who was one of the prominent leaders, who was convicted for this offence, for corrupt electoral practices under section 123. Other than that, most of the leaders and politicians have gotten away with it. And this again points to the weakness in enforcement and implementation. Right? So, Election Commission also is constrained here, usually for model code violations. It only debars the candidate from campaigning for two to three days. So this is not a strict penal provision, right? If they were debarred from contesting elections itself for six years, that would have been a more effective option. Even though the law provides for it, it's often not employed by the Election Commission. It only uh, treats this as a model code violation and debars the candidate from campaigning for two or three days. So, due to the lower penal provisions that election commission has been using, it has in a way encouraged uh, the political leaders, you know, to blatantly ask votes uh, in the name of religion and caste and to divide the society as well on religious lines and caste lines. The Supreme Court has repeatedly observed that elections are sacrosanct. If elections have to be truly inclusive, free and fair, it has to be secular. It has to be inclusive of all the communities in the country. In a multi-diverse country like India, in a multi-religious, multi-linguistic, multi-ethnic society like India, it is important to protect that fabric, the social uh, secular fabric of the country 
and you can't allow politicians and political parties to rip up that social fabric. So in the Abhiram Singh case of 2017, the Supreme Court even brought up constitutional ethos that leaders and parties are expected to abide by these laws and uh, codes of conduct by respecting the constitutional spirit and the constitutional ethos and they have to keep any religious sentiments away from the state and the elections. But unfortunately, as I told you, parties and leaders have been using places of worship, not just during elections, but even uh, before or after elections. Places of worship is often misused by various parties and leaders to appeal to their respective vote banks. Similarly, re religious leaders often campaign for uh, political parties and leaders. Right? So this violates the spirit. It violates the very provision under section 123 and yet enough action is not taken and initiated against these leaders and parties. So that is where the concern remains. So now, what can be the way forward? If this issue has always persisted, if, if it really threatens uh, the very free and fair conduct of elections and the secular fabric of the nation, then what can be done going forward? See, political parties, they of course have a right to raise legitimate concerns which may have origin in caste-based issues or religion-based issues, etc. Now, for example, let's say the Dalits, scheduled caste, scheduled tribes have always been oppressed. Right? So, if there is a Dalit leader ra raising the issues of the Dalit community, then will that qualify as a corrupt electoral practice? In that case, no. The answer is no. Because if it is a genuine grievance, right? whether it is caste-based or religion-based or language-based, if there is a genuine grievance or demand of the community and if a leader is standing up, raising that particular issue, then this is tolerated, this is allowed. Because that is, that is the very purpose of a constitutional democracy, to satisfy the needs, the grievances of every section of the society. But if someone is using those issues just to seek votes and divide the communities and to create vote banks, then that is a corrupt electoral practice. This distinction has to be made very clear. Understood? This distinction has to be made very clear. For example, uh, there could be a linguistic group which might have certain genuine grievances about the protection of their language. There might be religious communities and they might have certain genuine grievances. Highlighting the grievances is different, but exploiting that for votes is different. So drawing a distinction between the two is essential to ensure that these violations are punished strictly as prescribed by law. So any appeal in the name of religion which leads to polarization has to be clearly identified by the Election Commission of India and by the courts as well and they have the duty to enforce the law. It is their duty. The Election Commission should not just debar them from campaigns for 2-3 days. It should invoke the provisions of RPA, Section 123, treat that as a corrupt electoral practice and debar them from elections for 6 years. The courts have to enforce the law. Right? So this is very, very essential in order to ensure that places of worship, religious leaders, caste issues, linguistic issues are not abused and exploited for political electoral gains. So this is extremely crucial given that India's unity, India's uh, stability depends on our social stability. And you can't have politicians and leaders and parties breaking that unity in the country which could, which could derail the electoral process itself. So that is the, the crux of the argument. And if you're able to understand these key points, it's more than sufficient. So most likely you can expect a mains question here, a possible prelims question as well on section 123 of RPA. Now let's look at a small announcement regarding the free special classes that we are running on the Unacademy app. This is the schedule for today on 26th March. We have three classes scheduled on the Unacademy app. In the morning, we had a NCRT fundamental session by Mukesh sir on a geography topic. Then at 1 p.m. I will be taking up a session on international relations where we will discuss the contribution of Prime Minister Modi to shape uh, in shaping India's foreign policy. Today is part one of the session. Tomorrow I'll be taking up part two of this discussion. 
and tonight at 7 p.m. Asta ma'am will, uh, will be taking up a current affairs session. So do attend these classes live and the links for the sessions are provided in the video description below. Now let's look at another article from the same page which also deals with an election related issue. This column is talking about district election management plan. I feel this is another important topic for your mains especially. So since general elections are being held, there will be a number of articles, number of uh, columns that deal with electoral related issues or election related uh, topics. So this is one important topic. What is the district election management plan? I don't know how many of you uh, would have heard about this, but let's explore the topic. It is a very important topic as far as the conduct of elections are concerned. When it comes to organizing elections in the country, the district election management plan plays a crucial role in aiding the election commission of India to conduct the elections in India. As you know, India is the world's largest democracy. The elections that we hold, the general elections, is the world's largest democratic electoral exercise. That's why it's even uh, referred to as a, a festival of democracy, right? So organizing general elections in India is not an easy task. It is extremely complex given the diversity of the nation and as well as the logistics that are required. So what the election commission does is truly incredible. Irrespective of all the criticism against the election commission, one should give credit to this constitutional body for pulling off almost multiple elections, including the state assembly elections, right? And it ensures that these elections are run in the smoothest uh, way possible, right? So how does the election commission actually do this? At the ground level, if you think about it, how are the polling booths selected? What facilities are provided over there? How does the election commission decide what personnel will be deployed with security force? Where will they be deployed? Right? How will all the logistics be arranged from EVMs to VVPAT machines to the ink which is uh, put on your fingers? Right? All the papers that are needed, the forms that are needed. How is everything arranged by the election commission in such a smooth manner in every polling booth, in every constituency across the country? Of course, first step is that it staggers the election process. Right? Gen general elections, sometimes even state assembly elections, they are not held on the same day. They are staggered in different phases so that it becomes easier to arrange the required logistics. But still, this is an incredible challenge. Right? So this is where district election management plan plays a crucial role in aiding the electoral machinery and the bureaucratic administrative machinery to conduct and execute the elections in the country. If you ask me, the district election management plan is basically the foundation of Indian elections. Such a smooth conduct is possible, right? It's possible to arrange all the complex requirements and logistics needed to pull off the elections because of the district election management plan. So let's understand more about the district election management plan. Let's understand what is it? How is it prepared? What details does it contain? And how does it aid the electoral officials and the administrative machinery to conduct elections in India? See, to carry out any exercise, there should be a lot of planning, right? Now, let's say, for example, you guys are preparing for civil services exam, which itself is a very difficult task. So, of course, you create a plan for yourself. You plan as to which subjects you will cover. You make a timetable. Uh, you give deadlines for yourself that I will cover these subjects within this duration. I will focus on uh, current affairs at this particular hour, right? And... You also assign some time for your test series, your practice tests, revisions, etc. That is part of your planning, right? It's the plan which actually helps you in preparing and executing uh, the overall uh, vision, right? And eventually, it, it will help you in clearing the exam as well. So similarly, for any complicated exercise, there has to be a planning process. And district election management plan is part of this planning process. At the district level, right? Extensive planning is done by the concerned electoral authorities and the bureaucracy and the administrative machinery. At every district, a statistics-based, analysis-based plan is prepared, which is a comprehensive document for that particular district or even constituency. Essentially, it gives you 
the profile of that entire district it's a very comprehensive document that is prepared which covers many aspects related to elections from the demography of the constituency to the socio-economic factors present to the geographical factors even meteorological factors right what's the weather in a particular month when elections are supposed to be held even such data is included in this comprehensive document be it the road network the presence of schools where are they present right the number of teachers available the number of government officials available in a district who can uh, help in the election uh, process all such data is documented all the statistics right and even the analysis of all the previous trends and patterns is documented in this plan so it basically provides us a complete district profile and this is prepared at least six months in advance before the tentative date of the elections right at least six months before that six months in advance the district election plan is prepared all right so this is a continuous process it's not that it happens only once right or it happens every time from the scratch it's prepared once and it is constantly updated right so once the new election cycle comes in the district election management plan is revised and updated constantly by the election commission by working with the concerned authorities so to implement this plan and to conduct the elections in that particular district it requires a lot of coordination between the election authorities the administrative bureaucracy and other stakeholders be it the security forces the state level uh, bureaucracy and uh, officers of the election commission right the entire administrative setup will have to coordinate with each other to ensure the successful implementation of this plan understood starting from the city police and the state police to the central armed police forces who are deployed right so this comprises your security and law enforcement agencies so they will have to coordinate with district authorities the state administrative machinery and the election authorities so it requires very good coordination between all of them to execute and implement this plan successfully so this plan is very comprehensive and even political parties and the media is briefed about uh, the dimensions of the plan the concerned candidates the parties contesting in that particular district right they're all briefed about the statistics and the analysis and this report is made available as well to all the stakeholders so this is a critical document at the district level which is prepared that helps in planning the election process so let us see what details are contained in this plan in this document what kind of statistics what kind of analysis and data is included so first to create a profile of the district right the demography the socio economic factors geographical factors everything is captured which lays the foundation for the electoral strategy in that particular district the election commission will have to follow a certain strategy sometimes in hilly areas there might be different challenges in moving the personnel in moving the material and equipment in flood prone areas the challenges might be different in extremely um, arid semi arid regions right the challenges might be different so the geographical factors even the demographic factors as well right the population profile of that particular district plays an important role in planning and implementing the election process so all these factors are considered and all the data the statistics related to it is documented in the district election management plan the key socio economic factors of the district geographical factors and demographic factors they are all captured which gives you the entire profile of the district understood so this is a key part of the district election management plan so this creates an entire map of the district a clear map of all the constituencies is created it started out and it aids the election authorities and the administrative authorities to plan accordingly and mobilize the resources and logistics that are needed next based on this they will determine how many polling booths should be set up where it should be located what facilities have to be given at the polling booth right all this is determined and documented in the district election management plan right election commission has a ground rule that polling booths have to be ideally within 2 to 5 kilometers from your house right it has kept a specific range to ensure that all the polling booths are accessible for the voters right 
so keeping this in mind and using the political map and the and the geographical factors of the region polling booths are selected usually schools are preferred sometimes other government buildings could also be utilized for the purpose and for every polling booth basic facilities have to be ensured there should be a ramp to ensure that senior citizens physically disabled can easily access the polling booth there should be wheelchair facilities parking facilities in cities especially drinking water toilet facilities which will be very important for the election officials they will be spending the whole day right they actually the polling officials they come a day prior to the polling station and they will remain there at least for a good uh, 30 to 40 hours right so they will need basic facilities especially in remote uh, hinterlands or in uh, rural areas right what if there is no toilet no water right polling officials will find it very challenging to 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 even function and carry out the basic tasks so if those facilities are not there creating those facilities providing basic access is very crucial right so all these details are documented how many schools are there which will be the polling booth what kind of facilities have to be created what facilities are already present all such data is documented in the district election management plan it also contains all information about voter participation in that particular constituency is that clear historical data regarding voter turnout is documented in previous assembly elections what was the turnout in previous general elections what was the turnout at this polling booth at this ward at this particular constituency now this data is crucial because it will help in planning and implementing the sweep plan of election commission sweep stands for systematic voters education and electoral participation plan it's a awareness initiative run by the election commission of india to spread voter awareness to encourage higher voter participation in the electoral process in order to increase the voter turnout you know that in many places in india particularly in some cities voter turnout is extremely poor right because there there is no incentive for several voters or they lack awareness regarding the value and the importance of their vote so election commission strives very hard to carry this message to every voter and encourage them and incentivize them to come out and vote so it will engage all media outlets from radio to newspaper to television even social media and the internet right it's it's it works with local schools and colleges the youth and local communities to spread the message across and to conduct these awareness campaigns to increase voter participation so these plans will become easier if the data regarding voter turnout is available let's say there are few constituencies and polling booths where voter turnout has been consistently above 80% then those polling booths are not a concern for election commission but let's say there are few polling booths where voter turnout has always been 30 40 or 50% or 60% which is very low so those polling booths those constituencies can be targeted under the sweep plan more initiatives can be run in those particular areas to ensure that there is greater voter turnout right more research can be conducted to figure out what is inhibiting the voters from coming out and voting right there must be something which is which is causing a problem right so it will help in the analysis as well so historical voter turnout data is documented under the district election management plan it becomes a critical input for the sweep plan which focuses on voter awareness and increasing voter turnout then it also contains details required for personnel management that is for deploying the polling officials and security forces as well for example in a polling booth how many officials are needed right from registration of a voter right where you sign a few documents and registers then you get the indelible ink on your finger and then you go and cast the vote right in that entire cycle how many officials are needed there right how many ballot boxes or evms have to be set up and who will manage them and the and the returning officer of that particular booth so essentially a count is needed regarding how many officials are needed what's the manpower requirement similarly security forces requirement the security profile of a region let's say a region is hit by a higher uh, violence rate let's say a region is affected by other security challenges like insurgency 
all these details will have to be documented so that accordingly the plans can be made for deploying the security forces and as well as the polling officials. So all such data is part of the district election management plan. There is a vulnerability mapping which is done with regard to the security threat present in every district and, in, and at every polling station. At high risk stations, more forces can be deployed. Let's say in the previous elections, there was a clash between two parties at a polling booth. So that can be marked. It can be red flagged as a high risk polling booth, as a vulnerable polling booth and more forces can be deployed. Correct? So such data is documented under the district election management plan. The previous MCC violations are also documented, right? So you know which candidates are more prone to commit these violations. So election commission can keep a watch on them, can monitor them more closely to check what kind of violations they might do and accordingly penalize them. So all these aspects of personal management, manpower management, right? Even this is part of district election management plan. Then finally, material management, especially the EVMs and VVPATs, right? This is what represents the electoral process itself. This is what documents our votes, the electronic voting machines and the paper trail, which is left behind by the VVPATs, voter verifiable paper audit trails. Apart from that, there is a lot, other lot of other material, which is also involved in the election process. A lot of stationary equipment is needed, right? You need the required amount of indelible ink. Seals and stamps are necessary. In total, believe it or not, there are a total of 61 essential items required for the conduct of elections. This has to be ensured, imagine, at every single polling booth. In each polling booth, in each school, for example, there might be multiple rooms, multiple polling stations. So every single polling station should have these 61 mandatory items. So it's not a joke or it's not an easy task to ensure the logistics and ensure that these supplies are there and readily available in adequate supplies. Right? They can't run out of it. There can't be a shortage. Right? So this requires enormous amount of planning. And election commission does this with great amount of precision thanks to the district election management plan. So here all the data is documented. These are the number of EVMs needed. This is the amount of indelible ink needed depending on how many voters are registered. Right? These are the stationary items needed. Everything is listed out well documented and even plans for storage of EVMs and VVPATs. Because you have to ensure their safety. You have to ensure the integrity of the entire electoral process and ensure that you store them in a safe and secure location. Strong rooms have to be created at the district level where all the EVMs can be stored before elections and immediately brought back after elections and kept there safely until the counting day. Right? So where will the strong room come up? What is the security needed? How will we transport the EVMs? How will we ensure security during the transit? arranging the buses for that, the security forces to accompany the EVMs which are being transported, right? This again is a huge task. So all these details are documented under the district election management plan, right? The storage spaces, the strong rooms, the security forces needed, the mobilization plan, the transportation plan, everything is documented under the district election management plan. So this essentially is a lesson in governance itself. It's not just about elections. You can apply this, this, this standard with regard to any administrative exercise or governance exercise because that is the amount of enormous planning that goes into the conduct of elections and district election management plan is a model for governance and administration. Right? All the required statistics, data, analysis, everything is documented here and it is frequently updated and revised and it is kept ready six months in advance so that there are no hiccups at the last minute and this is what helps in the smooth conduct of elections in the country. So that is why the topic is important. Right? It might be very factual, but still it is very important. You can expect a direct 10 mark main question where UPSC might ask you, what is the district election management plan? Discuss. Right? Now let's come to the last mains article on page number 8. We have this column related to the rise of China. Let's examine the column quickly and then 
we will head towards the prelim section. So as you know, China has emerged as a significant global power. It has challenged the United States and a Cold War rivalry has been going on between them where the two countries are competing for the superpower status. The US indeed is an established superpower since the end of the Cold War with Soviet Union. And now China is trying to claim that position or at least it, it wishes to replace the US as a leading superpower. So in this regard, China's geopolitical decisions, China's behavior in international relations is being examined by the writer. The writer specifically looks at West Asia region where complete chaos has engulfed West Asia region. And what role does China play in West Asia? The writer also looks at other regions of the world, other geopolitical issues of the world. And what is China doing with regard to these issues? And he's examining whether China can truly claim to be a global power and a and an emerging superpower. Now, for example, if you look at West Asia, in West Asia, there was always a major divide between the Sunni powers and the Shia powers. The Shia power bloc was always led by Iran. Iran has been the leader of the Shia power bloc along with uh, Syria, Lebanon and others. The Sunni power bloc has been led by Saudi Arabia along with the other Arab countries. So the major regional powers in West Asia have been Saudi and Iran and there has existed a, a very intense rivalry between the two. Between the Sunni and Shia power bloc, there has been a history of rivalry and both sides have even targeted and undermined each other. Right? The Sunni power bloc led by Saudi Arabia have often uh, sponsored covert proxy wars to target Iran and destabilize Syria. Iran and Syria have done the same. They have nurtured several extremist groups and, and other non-state actors whom they have used to target the Sunni powers and their allies, especially US and Israel. US and Israel are aligned with the Saudi power bloc, right? Now, recently, this division was in a way brought to an end with the mediation of China. In fact, Iran and Saudi relations had been completely broken because of regional rivalries and the way they were targeting each other. The relationship between Saudi and Iran had broken down and last year it was China which mediated between them. China acted as a mediator between Saudi and Iran and it achieved a detente. Essentially, it established a, a temporary peace between Saudi and Iran and both the sides agreed to re-establish their diplomatic relations. Now, this was a groundbreaking development in West Asia. This was something even the US had never managed to achieve. So many experts were of the opinion that the US power and influence is on the decline. Many analysts predicted that China is establishing itself as the dominant power in West Asia by, by leveraging its mediating power. This mediating power of China is primarily based on its economic strength. China has been a major investor in West Asian countries, in Saudi Arabia, UAE, Qatar, in all these Sunni countries, China has been a huge investor. China has strategic relations with Iran and even with Syria. When it comes to the Israel-Palestine question, China has firmly stood with the Palestinian cause. It has even gone to the extent of antagonizing Israel. Right? So mainly by leveraging its economic strength, its economic influence. It has been playing the strategic geopolitics of West Asia quite well, acting as a mediator as well between the regional rivals. But now the Gaza war has challenged the position of China. If you look at the ongoing Gaza war, it has threatened the detente which had been achieved earlier by China. The Gaza war has clearly split the Sunni and Shia powers again. Iran, on one hand, has pledged full support to Palestinians. Iran has been activating its proxies like Houthis in Yemen and other Shia militant outfits in Lebanon and Syria to target Israel, US and other countries. 
But on the other hand, the Sunni powers have largely remained a little silent. Uh, they, they haven't taken a, a clear stand, right? They continue their strategic ties with US and Israel, whereas they have just given lip service to the Palestinian cause. The Sunni powers say that we stand with Palestinians, but in reality, Saudi, for example, continues its strategic relations with US and its, its secret relationship with Israel as well, right? So this has tested the equations in West Asia and China, which has been an effective mediator. Right now, its role and its influence is under question. Writer is saying that China's influence is limited to its economic strength. Beyond that, it can't bring, let's say, its military influence or, or any other kind of pressure, diplomatic pressure on these countries to stabilize uh, these regions or to neutralize these conflicts. If you look at the Gaza war, if you look at the regional rivalries, if you look at even Russia-Ukraine conflict, right? if you look at the aggression of North Korea, on, with regard to all these major issues, China is either just a spectator trying to use its economic influence to gain uh, more, more reach and access, or in many cases, China itself is the instigator. So such a country, according to the writer, can never aspire to be a true superpower. It might have incredible influence today, but it's largely due to its economic strength. The writer is referring to China's Belt and Road Initiative and how this mega global connectivity project has fetched China a lot of economic influence. But this may not translate into geopolitical influence and China may not be able to deal with all the global geopolitical problems. Because recent experience has shown that China is falling short of the expectations that have that come from a superpower, right? So that is the illustration being provided by the writer here. The writer is also talking about a previous attempt by China to form a mediation group. China apparently had tried to bring some countries together to form an international mediation organization or a mediation group to mediate and resolve some of the standing global conflicts. So China had got the support of Pakistan, Sudan, and uh, Ethiopia and all these uh, middle powers in Asia and Africa, they were all brought together by China to create a so-called mediation group. Right? China often relies on its mediating influence to resolve conflicts, but this is largely limited to its economic influence. The moment its economic influence gets constricted, so China's geopolitical influence also gets constricted. Now, for example, if you look at what's happening in the Red Sea. And if you look at how the Houthis of Yemen have been targeting commercial ships. Here, China has not carried out any direct intervention. Right? Especially, China has not gone for a military intervention. In fact, even India has deployed the Navy closer to the Red Sea to counter the Houthi attacks. So, Indian Navy is not only countering piracy in the region, but we are also keeping an eye on the threat posed by the Houthis. But China has not carried out any direct military intervention. Why? Because obviously China, Russia both, they share very good ties with Iran, which is the sponsor of the Houthis. It appears that Russian and Chinese ships have been spared. They have not been targeted by the Houthis. So China has no incentive in that regard to carry out a military intervention. Right? It has largely stayed silent on this issue. It has only expressed that the shipping lanes should be free and there should be no such threats. But apart from that, it has not really tried pressurizing the Houthis or targeting the Houthis. It has left this entirely to the US. So US is doing the heavy lifting. Even when it comes to the mediation between uh, Israel and Hamas, which is going on in Qatar, it's Qatar which is acting as a mediator. Egypt is one of the mediators and China is playing no role in Israel-Hamas mediation. US is pushing Israel, Qatar is acting as the, as the middleman and Egypt is also one of the mediators. But China has no role in the ongoing Gaza peace process. Right? So what the writer is saying is that China limits its interference. China limits its role only to certain issues where it matters. Right? Where Chinese interests are being served, especially its economic and geopolitical interests. But it cannot bring any true leverage when, when there are conflicts going on, when there are major uh, tensions that are raging. 
China would be ineffective in dealing with uh, global uh, geopolitical issues and flashpoints. So there, this puts a question mark on whether China is a, a true superpower, right? And he says that China's uh, influence is limited to these uh, areas and these uh, tools. Apart from that, you, ca you can't really see China as a true superpower, unlike the United States. So now let's move on to the prelim section and take a quick look at the smaller articles in today's newspaper. On page number one, we have an article referring to the Digital Markets Act of the European Union, the DMA. Now, this is another important topic which is frequently in news, right? The Digital Markets Act was enacted by European Union a couple of years ago in 2022 and it has come into force last year and from 2024, it has been fully implemented in the European market. It essentially regulates the digital markets, the digital economy. It mainly places few restrictions and obligations on the so-called gatekeepers of the internet. It identifies some of the giant tech companies, the big tech companies, which almost have a dominating position as far as uh, internet-based applications are concerned. So these companies are brought under the definition of gatekeepers. For example, technology giants like Alphabet, which owns Google, which is the parent company of Google, then Amazon, right? Apple, Microsoft, Meta, which owns Facebook and Instagram, right? And even WhatsApp and even ByteDance, which owns uh, TikTok. So all these companies, these big tech giants are recognized as the gatekeepers of the internet, meaning they determine who has access to the internet? What will be your access to the internet? Right? How will you uh, enjoy different services and different uh, products on the internet is largely determined by these companies. So they have a dominating position in the market and they might misuse this, which qualifies as anti-competitive practices. So to deal with monopolies, to deal with antitrust, anti-competitive policies of these companies. This particular law was enacted by the EU. Is that clear? So under the Digital Markets Act, the EU has launched a probe against all these companies regarding various issues and complaints it has been receiving. All right. For example, recently Apple was delivered a hefty penalty. There was a case between Apple Music and Spotify right, where Spotify had alleged that Apple was deliberately misusing its advantage, which, which it has on the Mac operating system and creating an unfair advantage for its own music platform, which is Apple Music and deliberately discriminating against other music apps like Spotify. So Spotify had a very val valid argument that if Apple is controlling the payment gateway, the in-app in subscription, in subscription and giving Apple Music as a default app on iPhones, Obviously, Apple Music any day will have a, a higher advantage as compared to Spotify. So in this case, the EU, uh, the European Commission, which is the uh, executive arm of the EU, right, delivered a hefty penalty on Apple. Similarly, there are many other cases, right? So the EU has decided to club all these allegations and launch a probe against all these companies to see whether they are in violation of the Digital Markets Act. So if they are held guilty of these offenses, these companies could be fined up to 10% of their operating revenue in the European market. If they are repeat offenders, the penalty can go up to 20% of their operating revenue, right? So in a way, EU is setting the standards when it comes to these anti-competitive, anti-trust policies of some of the big tech companies. Now, this is very relevant for India as well, because even in India, similar concerns have come up. Recently, Google had delisted some of the Indian apps from its Play Store, which we uh, studied in detail, right? So just know the basics about the Digital Markets Act. Who are the gatekeepers? What kind of uh, restrictions and obligations are placed on them, right? What are the allegations against these companies? For example, Google is accused of misusing its dominant position in the Android market. Majority of the phones are run on Android operating system. And Google has this tie up with mobile manufacturers where it preloads some of its own applications as default applications like Google Chrome, for example, 
right? Google Sheets, Google Docs, you can't delete them. They come preloaded and you have no option of deleting them. So the other competitors, right? They can never compete with a giant like Google, which is already giving you all the applications loaded on its operating system, right? The, uh, this is one major issue. A small startup, which has a rival product, which is a competitor, can never compete with these other products of Google or even Apple for that matter, right? Because they already have an advantage. They control the operating system, they control the mobile market, and they can push their own products and applications and keep, uh, you know, cornering all the revenue and the profits. The same issue comes up with their payment gateways, right? In every app, you have these in-app in subscriptions, right? And the companies are expected to pay a big commission to Apple and Google. See, expecting a commission is fair because they are giving a marketplace where you can list your app and you generate your revenue. So paying re a part of the re revenue as a commission is absolutely fair. But the problem is with the percentage of the commission. Google and Apple have been charging commission in the range of 15 to 30%. This, according to many startups, it's very high, it's very prohibitive and it, it drives them out of competition, right? So this has been a major concern. And for every in-app purchase that you do as a customer, let's say you have uh, the Hindu app or let's say Unacademy's app, whatever in-app subscriptions you make, a part of that revenue should go to Google or Apple, right? Accordingly, where it is listed, either on Play Store or uh, the Mac Store. So the commissions that they are charging, right? It could impose a very heavy cost on other smaller startups, which can never compete with them. And since they control the marketplace, they have full leverage on these other companies. So these are the various concerns and allegations against the big tech companies. So EU has been doing a much better job in regulating them through the Digital Markets Act. So please know the basic details about these ongoing cases and also monitor the, the investigation that EU is conducting against these companies. Next on page 14, we have a small article which refers to the visit of Sri Lankan Prime Minister to China. Sri Lanka's Prime Minister Dinesh Gunavardhane is traveling to China for a bilateral visit and he's also going to take part in a, in a very important multilateral forum called the Bao Forum. So this could also be relevant for our prelims because this event which is organized in China, it's also called the Asian Davos. It's often referred to as the Asian Davos. So it's important to know what is the Bao Forum and why is it referred to as the Asian Davos. As you know, Davos is in Switzerland, right? This is where the World Economic Forum Summit is held. So something similar is organized in China for the Asia-Australasia region. And this is the Bao Forum. Just like World Economic Forum, which is held in Davos in Switzerland, brings government leaders, industry leaders, journalists uh, and academia together to discuss all economic issues, developmental challenges and geopolitical issues. On similar lines, there is a, a forum or a summit organized in China in the city of Bao in the Hainan province. Or, or, is that clear? So this forum, the Bao Forum for Asia, it was established by a group of 26 countries, 25 Asian countries under China's leadership, along with Australia. So they were the founders of this forum, which is a non-profit organization. And every year the summit is held in the Hainan province of China in the city of Bao. So it brings together top government leaders, then industry leaders, right, from important businesses in the Asia, Australasia region and as well as experts and academia, they all come together to discuss and debate on regional economic issues, global issues, developmental uh, issues, etc. That is why it is called the Asian Davos. It's the equivalent of the World Economic Forum Summit that takes place in Davos in Switzerland. It's modeled on World Economic Forum's Davos Summit. Understood? So 26 countries were part of its establishment in 2001 along with Australia, 25 other Asian countries under China's leadership. China is the leader of this forum. And several South Asian countries also participate in this forum, including Sri Lanka, sometimes Bangladesh and others. Even they are invited to participate in the forum. So it's headquartered in Beijing. 
the secretariat of the forum is in Beijing, but the summit is held in Bao in Hainan province. So these are basic facts that could be relevant for your prelims. Coming to the last article for today, on page 15, we have an article referring to the UN Agency for Palestinian Refugees, the Relief Agency for Palestinian Refugees. UN Chief Antonio Guterres has praised the work which is being done by the UN Agency for Palestinian Refugees. Since the Gaza war began, right, UNRWA has been doing an incredible job. In fact, since its establishment in 1949, it has been taking care of Palestinian refugees across the Levant region. So here, the UN chief, the secretary general, is, play, is, is essentially giving credit to the organization because recently this organization has come under a controversy. It was alleged by some countries, by Israel and few, uh, its, few of its Western partners, that some of the staff members of UNRWA were involved in the terror attack that was carried out on 7th October. The brutal attack that Hamas carried out on October 7th, which triggered the Gaza war, right? In this attack, it was alleged that there were few staff members of UNRWA, few Palestinians who were working for UNRWA were allegedly part of the attack that took place on October 7th. So based on these allegations, many countries, they cut off the support they were giving for the relief agency. They stopped giving donations. They stopped sending the assistance that was being provided to UNRWA. This has crippled the ability of the agency to provide relief and aid to Palestinians. So this is where the UN chief has urged the global community to focus on the relief work being carried out by the agency. It's doing a, a very important job in delivering basic aid and assistance, in delivering food, medicines and other essentials to Palestinians who have been completely displaced and who, who have been completely uprooted by the ongoing war in Gaza. So you should know the basic details about UNRWA. So I've added all the details here. It stands for UN Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian Refugees. And it's the only UN agency which is dedicated for looking after one particular refugee community, which is the Palestinian refugees. It operates specifically in Palestinian territory in Gaza and West Bank, and also in some of the neighboring countries in Jordan, Lebanon and Syria where Palestinian refugees are hosted since 1949. Because after Israel unilaterally declared independence in 1948 by violating the two-state solution, right? The Arab-Israel war broke out. And during this conflict, lakhs of Palestinians were driven out by Israel's uh, expansionism. Israel even went on to occupy Palestinian territory. And a large refugee crisis was triggered here. Palestinians were uprooted from their native land by the new Israeli state which had been created, right? So these Palestinians who fled to Jordan, they fled to Lebanon and some, some of them fled to Syria as well, right? To take shelter. And since then, they have been under the protection of the UN agency. UNRWA was established immediately following the 1948 war, the Arab-Israel war over Palestine. And since then, it has been providing relief for Palestinian refugees present in this region. Is that clear? If there are Palestinian refugees in other parts of the world, let's say a few Palestinian refugees have taken asylum in US or some of them have taken shelter in Europe, then they are looked after by the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, the UNHCR. But if Palestinian refugees are sheltered in these countries, in Jordan, Lebanon and Syria, and also in Gaza Strip and West Bank. So these Palestinians get aid and support and assistance from UNRWA. So it receives donations from UN members around the world. So various organizations also donate to UNRWA and India is also one of the big donors. Since we ideologically support the right of Palestinians to have their own state, right? And we stand with Palestinians with regard to human rights violations. India keeps donating to UNRWA and recently, after the Gaza war began, in December 2023, India transferred another $2.5 million to assist the Palestinian refugees and we donated this amount to UNRWA. So this is what you should know about the UN Relief Agency for Palestinian Refugees. So this concludes my discussion for today. 
please take up these two main questions for your answer writing practice. Please take a screenshot or write the question down. And of course, you can download the PDF as well, which is provided in the video description. So try and write an answer to the question and post that in the comment section below. I hope you guys have enjoyed the session today and learned everything. If you did, please let me know in the comments and without fail, subscribe to our channel. And also, I would like to remind you that on our Telegram channel, we have started the Hindu analysis quiz. So do subscribe to our Telegram channel. You can find the link again in the video description. And after the session ends by, let's say, 12, 12.30 p.m., we post a few questions which will help you in practicing these topics, in revising these uh, topics that we have discussed. So do subscribe to the Telegram channel as well. So that is it for today. Thanks for watching. Have a good day.